Welcome to the Break Check Podcast. Appreciate everybody being here today. It's a special episode. We got a special guest with us. We got E United's coach, Raw Greg. Appreciate you being here, man. Hope you're having a good morning. Hey, we're just going to jump straight into this and waste no time. You guys can see we've got some uh, topics here that we're going to cover today. And the first one is just going to be an introduction. I, I want you guys to get to know Greg a little bit. And so many of you, like I said, we, you guys are going to know him as the Rocket League coach. But Greg's got a rich history as a competitor, as a player as well. So we're just going to turn this over to Greg and let him kind of talk about how he got started in Rocket League, some of his 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 history that led him to where he is today. So, Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here, and uh, the floor is yours. Now, first of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate you having me and giving me this platform. So, it's crazy. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Greg. I'm the head coach at E United. I started playing this game in 2015, like preseason 2015, so July. I know Hootie because he was my coach. Before I started coaching at United on all mid, and uh, yeah, where else? I played a little bit for uh, a team called Sway Esports. Uh, I played a little bit for Soul Esports, just bubble teams. Nothing too crazy, no like professional play. Yeah, now I'm here. My first question would be kind of what led you to want to pivot from playing to the coaching route? Age. Okay. Pers <laughs> I mean... A lot of these new kids that are coming in, they're young, they're mechanical, yeah. they, they do different things. So um, when I first started playing the game, the game was drastically different. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a lot of you guys know, it was just, a lot of it was mental, um, rotational even. Yep. And now everybody coming up in the bubble scene, all the new professionals, they all have a level of mechanics that one day I looked at it and I said, hey, listen, I think I can impact the game better off the field than I yeah. can on the field right now. So. That was a big reason, but I think another thing was just I've always loved studying the game and getting a chance to coach a professional team, um, whether it be tactically, mentally, I thought I could contribute a lot to a team. Yeah. So that was the main reason. There's, an, there's just this wave of, of young talent that, you know, picked up the game a little bit later than a lot of the OGs and, man. I think you hit the nail on the head with the mechanical ability. It is, uh, it's really impressive. And, and I know you appreciate it too as just a, a Rocket League enthusiast. It's fun to watch, man. You know, the game seems like it's accelerating very quickly in the mechanical right. aspect. And it's not, that, it's not that if you're old, you can't play Rocket League. Like, right? You can still be Supersonic Legend. You can still be a top competitor. But mm -hmm. from where I wanted to go, yeah. I'm looking at, you know, G2, NRG, and I'm looking at the moves they have and the players that they have and the moves they make, and I'm like, hey, listen, it's just not going to happen. It's just not in the yeah. cards right now. So and I think at that level, it's different. There's, a, um, there's something to be said, too, that, you know, you're fighting a different fight in, in, in the mid-20s than somebody that's 15 years old, right? Like, you're very different yes. walks of life. And so, you know, everybody's got to make their own choices in it. And I know, you know, I know you and I know how competitive you are. And I know that you, you know, you want to, you want to compete, whether it's coaching, mm -hmm. whether it's, so I got a lot of respect for that. And I totally agree with you. I think you have more than, uh, more than most to continue to offer to the game. So I, I was thrilled when I heard about you moving into the coach role and, uh, you know, I'm a huge United fan. So, all right, let's jump to the I next one. That. Oh, you know it, man. Let's jump to the next one, and this one's going to be a really fun topic. It's something that has been hot on Twitter, on Reddit. We just finished this trade window, and so we want to talk about roster changes. We'll talk about E United and some of the things that you have gone through as a coach, and then we'll pivot more towards just roster changes in general. And so the first thing I want to ask is, I know E United made a roster change in this offseason. And so talk to us a little bit about that process, how you guys decided on candidates, how you guys whittled down those candidates and decided who was the best fit, um, you know, you can talk about the, the mechanics side versus the, menta the mentality side versus the like team chemistry and, and just team fit and stuff like that. And just like, um, you know, being on the same page with the same goal as, as your team and what the environment that you've created. And then I also do want to talk about, uh, because I know I saw this and I know that you felt it. Um, some, and, and this is relevant for some of the roster moves we're seeing now. Sometimes roster moves are met with a lot of backlash, right? And so I want you to talk about that and how that affects you guys as 
a, a team, but also as like people. You know what I mean? So just give us some insight on all that stuff behind the scenes. That's a lot. Um, so I guess to start, like you, you have to start at the beginning, and that would be that you know I came into the team, and the roster was um, Ajax, Tristan, Dapper, mm -hmm. and um, you know I hadn't been in like a professional coaching spot before, so when I came here, it's like, this is my team. This is what we're doing. This is like, this is my roster. I'm taking them to chip, no roster changes. And I mean, I truly believe that I could do that, but I think there was a certain level in the off season. I think we didn't have the results we wanted at all. Yeah. We weren't having the practice that we wanted, which is, is even tougher because when you're not getting the results, then the practice starts slacking. Mm -hmm. The environment, it's not that the environment was bad. It's just that the environment wasn't, it didn't feel like it was fruitful for um, growth. Right. And then I think it came down to the decision where I started hearing a little bit <clears throat> about um, maybe a couple players were thinking, hey, maybe we could try something. And at that point, like as a coach, I want to do what my players want, to yeah. be honest with you. So when I, both of them come up to me and say, hey, maybe we could look for somebody else. If not, like we want to go back to that. Or like it was a, you know, a pretty easy move in their head. So I said, okay. Let's do it. Um, as far as trying out people, it, it's tough because you, you definitely have a list of candidates and like being just removed from playing, I knew a couple people that I wanted to try out for sure. Hmm. I, don't, I don't really know how we got to the candidates we got to, but we tried out a couple really, really good people. We were pretty set on it, to be honest with you. We, I mean, we thought we had the player that we wanted. And then I, I was telling Ajax one day, I said, hey, listen, I know this guy. And his name's, his name's Savvy, and he's, and he's good. <laughs> yeah. And he was my former teammate. We tried him out. We had a good set of scrims. But more importantly, we had a really, really good environment. Yeah. And I think that Tristan and Ajax both picked up on it. And I knew that he would bring definitely a leadership mentality to the team, but more of like, I mean, you know him. Oh, yeah. Very, very, very alpha dog. So, but it was something that we needed. We needed like a killer mentality on the team where it was going to be, like, we bring this attitude to practice, we bring yeah. somebody that's hungry, but we're also bringing somebody that's going to unite the team. And when it came down to those criteria, it just was like, well, this is the fit. Then you head into, all right, we're going to go with Seal. The backlash from it mm -hmm. was, well, you know, Greg is just going into United and just picking whoever he wants. He's going to pick Seal up. He's going to pick Thunder up. He might pick up Omar. He, like, he's going to make it all mid. Right. And that wasn't the case. I mean... Really, the, the players chose Seal. Mm -hmm. Did I suggest Seal? Yeah, absolutely. But he had to try out. He had to earn the opportunity, and, right. and he did it. So the backlash is crazy because you start seeing stuff, and you don't really – it's not that you're not ready for it, but you see it. And a lot of these people that you know maybe haven't played against Seal or don't know Seal personally, they talk on Twitter, and you start seeing them say, like, Oh, it's a trash move. United's trash. They're a bad org. It's like, what? Or they'll say, oh, you know what? Greg, I know Greg. He's, he's just going in there. He's dismantling the whole squad. It's like, I'm just sitting there on my, on my computer like, what, what did I do? But mentally, I think it, more than just me, it was hurting the players where it's like, yeah. these guys didn't do anything wrong. They're just trying to make a roster move and just try to get back to where they think they should be. So Yeah, that's something that, and just to reference something that I know a lot of people are familiar with, the G2 stuff with Envy, Atomic, yeah. and Trees. You know, we've seen a ton of a ton of backlash, and some of it is constructed in a a, a reasonable manner, right? They're they're talking about Dre's performance on the field and what they think about it, and that's okay. But when we start to get into like personal attacks, I think those types of things are just it's not productive, and I think it's just it, it lacks a level of empathy, right? Like people yeah. forget that these are real humans that are playing these games; these are real people, and they got to understand, like, y'all got money on the line. Like, y'all want to win just like anybody else, right? And yeah. and we're not willing to sacrifice performance for, I mean, whatever they think a, yeah. a motivation would be to, to grab somebody that's not capable of playing at the professional level. But one thing I do want to touch on, you know, you mentioned that you thought you guys thought you had your candidate selected. You thought, hey, this is the one we're going with, and you guys can open the door for seal, and then things shifted a little bit. And so what I want to ask is, um, how, how does this scale work where, you know, we've got two players that are maybe similar in mechanical ability, 
and you know maybe one maybe one has more potential long term or or maybe one's a little bit ahead at the current moment and then you know so you got the mechanical side on on uh, one side of the scale but then you have that like you talked about that that super alpha dog super hard working you know great work ethic somebody that can unite the team and get that um just that team environment at a, at a new level and so you've got one side is mechanics and then one side is kind of personality character mentality whatever you want to call it intangibles maybe and and, yeah. and i want to ask that scale you know how does that work is is there one that's more valuable do you just kind of analyze both and see like okay well this one's ahead mechanically but this one's got you know more to bring to the team um you know, environment. And so how does that work for you guys? And what's most important from your perspective as a coach? Okay. So personally, mm -hmm. I think that if, you know, you could have the most young, potentially talented kid in the entire world. Right. Right. And if he's, but if he's a menace or he's toxic and he's going to bring a level of, I'll say vibes for lack of a better word yep. to the team that isn't going to allow for us to be ourselves. And, and that's tough too, because you just want everybody comfortable. Then me personally, I, I'm, I'm staying away from that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because at the end of the day, like, as far as being a coach, a lot of it is tactics. A lot of it is people having, you know, the best roster. But a lot of it, a lot of it is mental. That's right. And having a team environment that you come, like, I mean, you go to work every day. Like, I'm talking three hours, friends, whatever. And then in that time, you want to maximize practice. You want to maximize conversation, communication. If you have somebody slacking off one day mm -hmm. or just being 15 years old, if you're 15 years old and you're like, oh, yeah, by the way, here's thousands of dollars to play Rocket League, but go to work every day. They've never had a job before. They've never been yeah. on a team before. It's a it's a learning curve. And I think that it's not that you would you wouldn't take that chance. It's that you definitely have to talk to the person to know. So right. as far as criteria, like you said, like as far as seal goes, it was it was easy because I knew him. Yep. Like, like for sure, but it is going to come down to what the players want too. But when you put three people together, especially two people that you've been talking to every day, right? I had Ajax and Tristan in my corner. We're talking about this all the time. Like, oh, what do we get? Who do we get here? And like, what do we do better here? And they're asking me coaches or they're asking me questions like, well, what do we do well with this player? What do we do well with this player? When you introduce a new entity into that environment, you know what fits and what doesn't. You know what's going to be okay. This this person's going to be good for morale. This person's going to be good for our defense is going to be good for offense, a plethora of things. But I think Seal checked the boxes on a lot of intangibles for sure. And it was something that I thought we desperately needed on this team, yeah. like desperately. And it's not saying that Ajax and Tristan are um, like stand up people. They're great people. And they're hard. They're the hardest working two people. I know, like if you look at their hours, they, they go crazy. But I think they needed a voice to guide them and say, all right, here's the engine that you guys are trying to get to anyway. And it can't just be me because I'm vocal and you know that, Oh yeah. but it can't be the, it can't just be the coach. It has to be the players and the coach combined into one. And when I saw that seal was kind of bringing uh, an energy, it was huge, but then combine that with the fact that our offense was clicking and like from the way that we even play right now, like we play hyper fast, hyper aggressive. And when we talk to all the players, it's like, that's how we want to play. We yeah. don't want to play defensive. We, it's a new meta, and although Seal's, you know, 22, 23 years old, he's, he doesn't play like he's 23. He plays like he's young and cracked. So, yeah, yeah it was a lot, but it's, it's most of, for me personally, I think a lot of what I look at is more mental and how, like, the team is going to fit together. Yeah, and I think, uh, I, I think I would agree 100% um, if I were in your shoes or, or, or working as a coach. Those things that you mentioned where it's, like, mechanically and, and, and like, strategically, how does a team want to work? You know, you get everybody on board, but I think the foundation, the very first thing that you have to establish is like, can we work together, right? Yeah. Can, can that environment, can, cause, because things are going to get rough, right? And you are going to have times where it's like, we, you know, we're doing X right now and it's not working. So how do we get to, how do we find a solution? And it, it takes everybody um, in the right headspace and it takes a good team environment. And so I, I think I'm, I'm right there with you, man. And, and I would totally agree and, and totally back you up on that. For sure. It's, to be honest with you, this game is just, it's just so mental on so many mm -hmm. different levels. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, anybody that plays Rocket League knows that sometimes you come out of the game and you feel like a brick. Right. And sometimes you come out of the game and you feel amazing. And most of the time, it ain't because you, you have heavy car bug. It's because you either feel good that day, yep. you got enough sleep, you're drinking, like you're drinking water right, and you're confident. Or you come out of the game, you got some pent up frustration or you're tense right. and you play set. So that's right. That team environment goes a long way, I think.
And I totally agree. So let's uh, let's jump to this next one. And this is a this is a fun one for me. What is a coach? I think specifically in esports, there is a little bit of a misconception around coaching. There are so many times. And I'm sure that you have been asked this. I know that I've heard and seen other coaches, whether they tweet about it and post about it or, or whatever. Viewers will come into a stream and say, well, how can you how can you coach when your players are better than you? Right. And so That's there's, crazy. Just, there's just this misconception that what's really interesting about it from from my perspective is we don't have that same outlook towards traditional sports. Right. Like mm -hmm. we don't have we don't share that same sentiment of the coach needs to be better than the players. It just doesn't really, no. it doesn't click that way. So I just want to kind of get your uh, perspective and, and kind of pick your brain about what is a coach and, and kind of what do you do with your team? And you can, you can outline, you know, what does a day look like or what does a week look like? And some of the things that I imagine many of us on the outside won't know that a coach does behind the scenes. Whew, okay. I mean, what is a coach for esports? It's different. It's drastically different than regular mm -hmm. sports. Um, I think with esports, the main thing is you are a lot more similar to age than a coach in regular sports. You know, you have coaches that are six years old in regular sports, and their players can be, you know, college kids, high school kids, whatever. Um, but it's more like being a professional coach because, you know, sometimes you have a 40 year old head coach and your players are 35, 30. Right. Um, but you're coaching people that are, are peers to you. So the, the way that you coach them has to be respect first, I think. And, and that, that, to be honest with you, that's something you taught me. Like, you always told me when you came into Almond, you said, hey, look, I'm not going to come in here and start telling you guys how to move around and do anything crazy. Like, I want you guys to, like, first understand who I am, and then we can start talking about, like, you know, tactics and how to move forward. So um, that's big coach hootie for – that's a good <laughs> hootie fact. But honestly, it's true. You have, to, uh, you have to gain the respect of your players, and I think that – a lot of esports coaching is mental. It, it really, really is. Like, yeah. if you want me to tell you about how to get better at the game tactically, yeah, of course, there's going to be tactics involved. But the main things that I focus on is, you know, group bonding. Yep. It, number one, but number one, number one, open communication. You know, in Rocket League, everybody, nobody communicates. Like, they're, every single team drama situation that you get that anybody sees on Twitter can be solved with seriously if you just talk to the person yep. and figure out what's going on. You would never have this issue. That's right. So the number one thing I introduce the team is, hey, listen, learning how to talk to each other in difficult situations through adversity um, and addressing each other. It's not like, hey, you know, if if Tristan's having a bad day and Ajax is like, well, Tristan, no, 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 I'd always tell him, talk to him. Like, Tristan, you, because then you get comfortable addressing each other and, you know, it could be a really, really off day. Yep. But if that happens in a tournament or a big match day or qualifier, what are you going to do? Talk to me? No, talk to him. Um. But a lot of it is like, it's unifying your group, but also like finding a formula and a game plan that everybody's comfortable with and that you just get them on the same page. Yep. As long as you can get your team on the same page and they're all linked together, I think you do a good job as a coach. There's a lot of off the field stuff that for sure you have to work through, but um, on the field, it's really just, you know, reminding the guys that they know how to play the game and yep. you're right. Like, do they play the game better than me? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that I don't know what I'm talking about. And that's part of the earning the respect is that maybe you say something one day that they're like, oh, I didn't even think about it like that. And then they do it and it makes them better. Now it's respect points for you, which means the next time you say something, they might say, okay, well, what do I do here? And then once they learn to trust you and like mm -hmm. trust the way you see the game, it has nothing to do with skill level whatsoever. That's right. Nothing. I think my, uh, and, and it's pretty much, kind of the visual representation of what you're describing right now. My favorite way to like think about a team is that classic, um, like you see geese flying overhead and they've got that V, right? Oh, like yeah. Everybody's pointed in the correct direction. We're all on the same page, moving the same way, heading towards the same goal. And I think, you know, in its simplest form, that's what a coach is, right? It manifests itself in so many different ways. Like you're talking about earning that respect, getting yeah. the players to like you said, communicate with each other, right? We can't just hide behind coach and say, hey, coach, I don't like that this is going on. I don't like he's doing this or he's making these mistakes and say, okay, well, let's talk about this, right? We got to get to the bottom of it. And, and another thing is like, you know, it's tough because we were talking about before how, you know, it can't just be me talking. Mm -hmm. Like there, a coach doesn't replace the need for the players to talk. Right. That's, that's the other thing is like, you can't just sit there as a player and say, 
you know, this is what's going on in the field. Hey, coach, what do I do? Like, and I'm going to have this perfect solution. That's not how coaching works. It's like, you know, we're all talking together to find out what's going on. And then, you know, we can implement it in the right way, but it's, it's a two way street and being a coach is, it's difficult to, to get your players on the same page, but it's also the players got to number one, fully, fully buy into what you're talking about. So you could be those geese. The other thing that I did want to kind of touch on is just what does a, a day-to-day or a week look like for the coach? Because I know there's things that, like I said, that, that I know that you do yeah. that I don't think a lot of others know. Um, and so just, just give us some of those things that you may be doing behind the scenes. Well, so I also manage the team. So yeah. that's actually, for real, for real, the hardest part. Right. Like the coaching part for me, it, it's, it's very natural and easy because the guys are really, really good. But, you know, I schedule scrims for them. I have to keep a schedule. Um, update the organization about what's going on with the team. Uh, I take notes on every scrim session that we do. So anytime we have a scrim with the team, I'm taking notes, saving replays, going over replays with the team, a lot of individual replay review, but then also in scrims and in tournaments, like it's just being present for them, Mm -hmm. keeping them on the same page. And if there's any issues within the team, which there haven't been at all, then I'm there to listen to them. And I've always like, one of the things that I think that it's just individual, like, it's just trust. So yeah. if somebody has a problem, they can talk to me. Obviously, I, and I always tell them, you can talk to me individually. But if you do have a problem with the whole team, like, and it involves the whole team, I'm going to tell the whole team. You can tell me first. But if it's a business problem, let's talk about business. But I want to keep them, like, you know, number one, friendly, but also business focused. So mostly it's just that. It's yeah. scrims. It's notes. It's communication with the org it's and then it's just preparation preparing them for like what's coming up even just this weekend like we have a day three on sunday and then obviously regionals the next week so one thing that i love that you said i know that there's a lot of people that don't realize i I think there is a general sentiment uh, of people in the esports space that are consumers and viewers that have never really competed in a team environment and i think that they have this idea that a coach might watch a replay on his own and then come tell the team like hey you're doing this wrong this wrong this wrong we need this adjustment, this adjustment, this much, this adjustment. Good luck. Right. Go scrim. And it's not like that, right? No. And so the thing that I love that you said is being present. And I think that ties in really big, at least in my opinion, really big with what you talked about initially is earning that trust, earning that respect. You got to get in the trenches with them, right? You got to be there. Number, 100%. You got to be there when things are going well in scrims. You got to be there when things are going poor in scrims. You need to be there and experience all of that with those guys, right? I think that is super, super important. And so I love that you said that, that uh, you know, be present with them. I think that's super important. Going through the ups and downs on, on a daily basis, sometimes even just that is crazy. Like, yes. I remember, you know, I came in and I'm thinking, first of all, we're never losing a scrim, you know. Like you have that mentality where it's like, I think I'm so, like, I know what I need to do for this team. But the impact that you have to have off the field compared to on the field, as a player, you know, I can tell them a bunch of stuff that I would do, like maybe with all that we were doing, yeah. but as a player, I can implement it. When I'm a coach, I just can't, I'm sitting That's there right. watching them. And sometimes I'll say something and they do it and it fails. And you sit there and you're like, Hmm, that's on me. But, <laughs> but sometimes it's good to have them. Like, it's good to go through those ups and downs with them because we all make mistakes. If somebody whiffs the ball, guess what? They whiff the ball. If I make a bad call or one of our players makes a bad call, we make a bad call. But because we go through that together and the communication's so open, it's huge. Like it, it, it builds that trust. And if you're in the trenches yeah. together, like that first regional for us, we didn't even make it. Like yeah. we just we we bombed out. But I think it was a learning experience for all of us. And that next whole like week and a half, we were going crazy. Like that night, you know how we are. Like we were talking oh, yeah. on the phone for like four hours. And we were just like, we can't do that again at all. And I think it just, it bonded us more that it was like, nobody was getting on each other. Like, Hey, like I got to look for a new team. It was just like, how do we get better? Yep. And once we tackled that, it was like improvement, improvement, improvement. And now we're at where we're at and there's still improvement to go every single day. So, so another thing that you mentioned that I do want to touch on before we head to the next topic, um, you just kind of talked about or, or alluded to the fact that it's a collaborative effort and the coach is there to maybe guide the discussion or navigate, you know, this direction or, or help push them in the way that you think would be uh, beneficial or advantageous to the team to move this way. But it's a collaborative thing. It's not something where a coach come in, comes in and assigns things or commands them, right? You, yeah. you, you get that feedback from the team and we see what everybody wants to do, and then we form 
a solution or a plan and we start moving that way. So I, I love that. I think, you know, that that is something that I think is important and, and my philosophies as far as a coach. So I, I love to hear that. Um, and I think that is probably, again, a little bit surprising to some of the folks on the outside because like what do I they said, think, though? Well, I, I, I truly think that a lot of people feel as though the coach is somebody that comes in and says, this is incorrect. Do it this way. This is the correct way. This is incorrect. Stop doing this. Um, you know, I think that they and is there aspects of that in coaching? A hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you're, you're probably not doing your job if you're not doing some of those things. But like you said, it's a collaborative effort. You may offer a solution and then we discuss it or even try it out. And we say, you know what? That may not be the correct solution. Let's adapt it and change it this way a little bit. And, and I think that even like, especially in Rocket League, this, this game is just so fast. Mm. Like, you know, you can't just sit there and say like, and this is, I mean, this is just a personal thing. So if yeah. anybody's going to hate on me for this, it is what it is. <laughs> you can't just make everything so rigid. It can't just be like, right. when you're in this position, do this. When you're in this position, do that. You can advise them that, hey, maybe this person, like most of the time, if you do this, you'll be okay. But that doesn't account for five other cars in the field, where the ball is, how much boost you have. It's about making calculated but like instinctual decisions. Yeah. And it's teaching the instincts so they can react quickly and then also react like in synergy with each other. And that's just it's it's a tough, tough game to coach. And tactically, I think that most of the time you just want to train like speed and you want to train really just instincts, it's just speed of reads. This is a crazy game because I think that. If you go into a coaching, hey, you have to do this. Don't ever do that there. Don't ever do that there. You're going to have them thinking. And it's probably just going to lead to bad results. I'm sure there have been coaches in this game that go in there and go, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. And maybe they've had success. Yeah. But do I believe that's how coaching should work in esports? Absolutely not. And I don't think that's how coaching should work at all anyway. But that it's tough for esports because especially this game, Rocket League, you're not yeah. going to find success telling people, oh, you always have to do this. You always have to do that. Right. You can work on a plan, but... It's not that simple. I totally agree, man. I think something that happens when you are, and I love the word rigid. You, you mentioned we, we can't be too rigid. I think something that happens is we we, we take away that creativity, right? Yep. These are yep. some of the best players on, on planet Earth, and uh, we don't want them to, we don't want to limit them. We don't want to put them in a box and say, you can only do these things, right? So I right. love your take on that. I think that's, um, you know, I would, I would agree 100%. So this next little topic we got here, uh, it's interesting, and, and the way I want to approach it is I, I want to think about, uh, there was a question that somebody from my Twitch stream asked, and I love it, and it's just kind of the evolution or progression of the game, and I want to mm. look at it through the frame of mechanics versus the mental side, and we've talked at length here about how important we think the mental side of the game is. I think it always has been important, and I do think it always will be, and we've got the scale here, but I want to get your okay. take on how has the game changed? you know, as far as a player becoming a professional and what wow. do you think, uh, you know, again, that scale with mechanics versus a mental, is it tipping one direction? Has it always been one way and now it's kind of leaning the other, you know, what is your take on that as, as a coach from your perspective? I think in the beginning it was all mental. I right. think that you had certain people that are obviously way better at the game, mm -hmm. like the skill gap was just huge. So it was like, either Those you're vets, good, right? Yeah. either you're good or you're not good. So you're a pro when you're good or you're not good. Now, Everybody, everybody is good at the top level. We're talking about bubble into the pro level. These players are good. Every single one of them in their own weird way, whether you want to think that some players are bad, that's on Twitch chat. But <laughs> these, guys are, these guys are good. So I think the skill gap is closed. That being said, I still think for some stupid reason, people are going to look at a mechanical player, especially, especially players that aren't as mechanical, and they'll say, I need that because he can flip reset. He can create this. And true, but I think the best players still look for both. It's like a mechanics, right. mental. Because I think a lot of pro players, I'm talking about high-level professional players, they don't want just a mechanical kid that's going to come in here and be toxic. That being said, there are some prodigies that you know, the, you know, there are some kids that come into this game where you look at them and you go, hey, look, if we bring them into a good environment, maybe he learns to be with the team. Right. Because there are some kids in this game that are seriously just so good. They have the mental, competitive mental at least, and the mechanics where it's just like, I mean, you can't, you can't miss it. They're worth that risk, some of them. 100%. 100%. So I, what it sounds like is at the beginning of the game, mental. the mental was by far the most important thing. Um, and, I think, and I think players got there because, again, like you said, SART vets. Yep. And then the, I think the bubble at the top pro scene, let's just like call it a bubble up there. It was 
you just had a rotation of SARP vets going around. Yeah. And getting people into there, it was impossible. Like you couldn't break that bubble. Mm -hmm. um, there was no way to do it. You could try to qualify for ROCS, but eight teams made it, and all these SARP vets are just teaming with each other over and over. You weren't going to beat them. Right. I remember Hollywood Hammers, I think, made it the one year, and it was Memory, Halcyon, and Lemon Puppy? I think it was. And they made it, and that was crazy because I don't think any of them were SARP vets. Yeah. You start, like, once you start breaking into that bubble, and now with the new format, way different. Yeah. Um, six Mans became a thing a few years ago. So then if you got Rank X, you could team with other Rank X people. That's just how it was. If you're rank X, you're the king. If you're rank A, you're the king. But then if you're rank S, a pro might try you out. Right. It's crazy because now six mans is gone. It, it feels like it's six mans is gone. Like I, yeah. I think I was telling you the other day, like yeah. I don't think, I don't know who's in rank X anymore. I remember there was a point in time when people used to tweet rank X and it would get like 1,500 likes. <laughs> and now I see people tweet rank X and it's like, 80 likes, 90 likes. It's just not the same. It doesn't have right. the same weight of like, oh, that player's on the come up. It's just this open format with the way it is. It's crazy. And it's something that you mentioned uh, in our conversation just the other night where you talked about even in Chicago's twit longer about the recent thing, he talked about, I played Drees and ranked and then said, hey, you want a sub? Like, yep. you don't have to take the six man's route anymore. But it sounds like, it sounds like in the beginning, the mechanics weren't all that important. It was way more about the mental um, but it sounds like the mechanics are starting to kind of level up where that scale may be level and you got to have mm -hmm. both, right? You can't just be a yeah, mental absolutely. only player and you can't just be a mechanics, uh, you know, wizard. You got to have, you got to have the full package to, to, to get to that highest level at this point in the game. And that's why a lot of these people that talk about these pros on teams and it's like, oh, like he's an idiot or any crazy word they want to say about these mechanical <laughs> players. Listen, they would not be on a pro team if they were just idiots, right? Like, these guys actually do know how to think about the game. And the issue is, is that the game moves so fast that sometimes you make a stupid decision, but you're making uh, like reactions in 0 0.01, 0 0.03, yeah. anywhere. Like I'm talking milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And if you make one weird jolt of your car, you're out of position. Yep. So it's a tough game. It's a tough game. And that, that kind of circles back to the, the, the beginning when we were talking about how exciting the game is now. You know, back in the day, it's so funny going back to watch clips and you see like an infield pass and it's just a top corner shot and the, the casters are just going absolutely buck wild, right? I can't believe, you know, they're going crazy. And now we see freaking double flip reset passing off to, a, a you know, a, a, a player that came off the ceiling and is now backboard double touch. And it's just like, it's a good play. But it's really just not even crazy anymore. You just see that yeah. stuff now. And so the evolution of the game has been absolutely wild to watch. And, and I just think... Just a power shot back in the day used to get the power going shot. crazy. If it was like, if somebody would pass it down from the wall. Right. And all they would have to do is go to the wall and pass it down. They're like, that's a perfect pass. And now it's like, if that happens, people are like, where's the defense? This team yeah. like, this team's struggling. So it is the, the evolution of like what is good in this game. If you just go back and you guys ever want to like just get interested, just go watch season one. Mm -hmm. That is a crazy, crazy. It's a it's a completely different game. It's a trip. All right, so we're gonna bust into our last section here, and I have um, I have fielded some questions from my stream throughout the past week, and so I have some questions here, and some of them I'm gonna skip because we've kind of touched on them already. But we're gonna jump through these and, Ask and me we'll some get heaters. Give me we'll give me the hot ones. <laughs> Okay, hold on. Let me see. We'll, we'll ease into it here. Someone asked, how do you get a coaching job? And I, I, I would love to weigh in after you do uh, because I think people kind of have the wrong uh, approach to it, to be honest. How do you get into coaching? Ooh. The way I got into coaching was I played. Yep. So me, and that's a, that's a very popular one, route. The game. Yeah, number one, playing the game. So playing the game that you coach. But I also played at a high enough level that I met a lot of, or that a lot of my friends that I met yeah. ended up becoming pros. Um, a lot of the compet, like the the peers that I had, ended up becoming pros. And all of a sudden, it was just like, you know, we would be talking and we'd be looking at replays. I'm talking to them about, you know, what's going on in the field. They yeah. come back to me over and over again, and all of a sudden, now I'm the replay guy. But I think you develop rapports with people like that. Yeah. And so for me, it was just that I had, I was lucky and fortunate enough to have a lot of the people that I came up with in this game become pros and they were like, well, you know who I want to coach me, Greg. So yeah, it was a great, great way. But I think number one, playing at the game, playing the game at a high level is a great tool. It's like, but if you're not playing the game at a high level, I think putting yourself out there and branding yes. yourself, yes, then people will learn about you. And, you know, 
number one, you through your TikToks and through your YouTube. I think that that's how I remember you were on RBG and with the reason that we found you is because you were tweeting stuff on Twitter and I was like, I don't know who this who, who guy thinks he is, but you had R but you had RBG playing like crazy. And I remember me and Seal used to talk about it like, well, that seems all hootie who. So when we wanted a coach, we looked up your YouTube, we looked up and then we were like, all right, that's our coach. But if you don't brand yourself, another person that's really, really good at it that I have a lot of respect for is Ronskian. Yep. I think that Ronskian is, you know, he's just streaming and, you know, he advertises himself, but he'll just take people into replays. And if you you know by just listening like listening to him talk, you're like, okay, that's a good coach. You just yep. know. Right. Um, but the only way you can do that is through visibility, I think. So mm. I, I either totally you go agree. the playing route or just brand. Yep, that's it. I think you got to put yourself out there. And I think a lot of people expect that they decide in their head that they want to pursue coaching, so they should get a, an opportunity to coach. Yeah. And that's just not, that's not reality in coaching or Rocket League or life. you got to prove your value before you can expect somebody to take a chance on you. You know, a funny thing, you're talking about I, I coach RBG, so I was posting some videos and stuff, and, uh, and I don't mind to throw kind of, I don't mind to kind of throw Clavin under the bus here, but he was telling me, um, and this is after we had become friends and after the team, uh, we had been together for a long time, and he told me, he said, man, I used to think it was so cringe that you were putting those things out, like on YouTube, and you know, when, when nobody's watching, it is cringe, right? Like, you get 30 views on YouTube, and it's tough mentally. Um, you're, you're putting those tweets out and, and you got to, like you said, you got to put Two yourself lights, out yeah. there. It's tough. And so I think the biggest thing is just first and foremost, don't become entitled, like be willing to take yeah. any and every opportunity and just don't expect, you know, don't expect too much. You've got to work and you've got to prove your value and show yourself uh, or show your value to the community before you can um, receive those kickbacks. And it's not, I mean, it's going to take a long time. It's not going to be easy, but you know, do you, that, do you uh, think that for you, it was hard to like, because I think me and you come from very different coaching angles. Mm -hmm. Like, you were more the the content route, and yep. also like, but you also proved yourself. I think. Yeah. What What do you think was your challenge, or still is your challenge? Yeah. Like, I think no. I think you nailed it, man. I think it's really really tough when you don't have a recognizable name, when you don't have a large brand. It's tough to gain that respect. It's it's not an easy thing to do, and that's why I say. Hey, I volunteer. I, I, so I graduated with a, a degree in education with a coaching license in my state, which is Arkansas. I volunteered at a high school uh, esports program, helped lift that off the ground. I volunteered at a collegiate esport, helped that lift that off the ground. I volunteered as like a third string coach under Lights Out, Kevy P. Right? If you don't know like Kevper, you know yep. you got to you got to go yep. do some research. So I, I yeah, listen right. and learn. Right? I volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. I start writing volunteer articles um, for Gamers Ready. Volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. I, I think I worked for almost two years straight without seeing a dime. And it's tough, you know. But you, if you want something, you know, sometimes you're going to have to take the road less traveled, right? You got to make yeah. those sacrifices. And so I actually, I totally agree with what you said. I think branding is, is big time. You got to be able to put yourself out there, which is tough, man. It is tough to, uh, it is tough to put your stuff out there and put what you believe into the world for any and everyone to judge and comment, it, it's tough to do. So that's and, probably the and biggest challenge. that's a challenge. crazy thing, too. People just comment on it and, like, they yep. act like – well, I think they know you see it, but I don't know, like, if they really understand that you see it. Yep. They know you do, but they don't get it. Mm -hmm. And so, like, somebody could – and I think it becomes – this is even going back to the roster moves. You know, people make moves, and it's like right. you look at this guy, like, you know, if you judge your favorite NBA team or your favorite NFL team and you sit there and, you know, you call them, you know, dog on Twitter, you're like, that guy's terrible. All right. Maybe he doesn't see it. But maybe he does. That's a human being on the other side that you're just telling he's bad, he's terrible. I think it's really, really tough to do content the way you did because, you know, it's – there might be a pro out there that tells you, like, oh, who he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's like, but you do. You actually really, really do. But that opinion can travel, and it's, it's tough to put content out there and, like you said, have it be judged. Yep. So, yeah, I, that's why I was asking you because I think that it's tough to – your route, to be honest with you, is way tougher. I'm going to be – I agree. That's what I think. I agree. Um, all right, let's jump into this one. This is a, a really, really fun question. And um, all, right. all right, so as a coach, what would you say is the hardest part about dealing with the younger crowd? Rocket League is usually geared towards a younger audience. Most pros and aspire, or most players and aspiring pros are 16 to 22. And as a coach, how do you gain the respect of those players? And how have you established yourself as a role model 
in that coaching position. And I do want to, you know, pause and kind of go back to where we were talking about, like the difference in traditional sports yeah. versus versus this. And I think that's, you know, you said esports is a very different. It's a very different game, and it is. Um, and I think that is probably the biggest one because, hey, you you might have a kid on your team making thousands of dollars a month playing in front of hundreds of thousands of eyeballs, and yo, they can't even get a driver's license yet. Yeah. How do you navigate that? Because that person, they don't have much life experience. You mentioned they may not have had a job yet, right? They haven't been through a lot. And you like that's tough for adults to, to, to face that criticism, to be in those high stakes, high pressure, uh, you know, environments. And especially in esports where you got two other teammates that might be 17, 18, and if they decide they don't want you, there goes those thousands of dollars, right? That money is all gone, and it could be, you know, it could be taken away from you in the drop of a hat. So I know it's a ton of pressure, and, you know, and then we, I, I want to open up this too. We've got some of these kids that say things, and they do things, and they think it's behind closed doors or whatever, right? And then it gets exposed. And so just, you know, how, how do we navigate that as a coach, and, and what are some of the things that you could do to help those players um, just get through those situations? So I think first, like, you talk about, like, the younger crowd, it's just talking. Yeah. I, I, I really, really just think it's talking. I think that, like, you know, age is just a number. And I know it's a weird, weird thing to say, but it really is. Like, yep. there are some 15-year-olds that are 30. There are some 15-year-olds <laughs> that are 10. There are some 15-year-olds that are, are 40. It doesn't matter. Um, but there are some 15-year-olds that are, you know, 18 to 19. Yeah, life experience and wisdom goes a long way. But I think that the more you talk to somebody and you just you level with them on the same, like, I think if you go into a 15 year old and you start telling them, Hey, listen, I'm the boss. Like this is what we do here. Like yes. you're going to scare him and he's not going to respect you. That's right. But I think that if you can get him to buy into him or her to buy into what you're saying mm -hmm. and find a common ground with them, I think that you create a more meaningful relationship, which will probably translate into them viewing you as, Oh, I should listen to that person rather than I have to listen to that person. I love that, man. I think that's super important. You know, I mentioned I had an education degree and I worked in the education system for a few years before I started doing this. And um, that's the approach I had with those students, too. You know, when when uh, when you don't ever invest and you don't ever bring them up, you know, when you, it's just negative, 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 yep. that's what you're going to get back. Right. If if you don't have anything to lift them up, they're, they're, they're not going to have a ton of respect for you. So I totally agree. And um, it's the this, same thing with like you're talking about earning respect, too. Like, yeah, yeah. It's about being in the trenches with them. Yes, that's like, right. It's if you're in the trenches with them and you're losing or you're winning and just be, like I said, it's just being present for them. If they, if they need something, they know all my players know all my friends know if you need me, if you message me at three in the morning, I'm there. If you message me at four in the morning, I'm there. It doesn't, I don't care. It's yeah. just, what are we doing? And then when you're in the trenches and they're going through something and you're with them and like, Hey, this is what we're going to do. Sometimes it's tough love. Sometimes it's like, Hey, yeah. listen, but they also know that if they ask me something, it's honest. That's the other thing. It's like open communication, but open, honest communication where it's if I ask Greg, is he going to tell me what he actually thinks or is he just going to you know, BS me around? Yeah. Um, but having that, like, again, it's just building a trust. And yeah. the 15 year old kids probably are a lot harder. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know a couple of, I know a couple of 15 year old kids in this game and most of them are, I mean, they're good kids, but yeah. It is a completely different level that you're bringing them into where it's like, you know, you have a 20 year old teammate, mm -hmm. a 28 year old coach, and he's telling you, hey, listen, this is what we got to do. We got to be professional. And you have your org owner coming in. Yeah. You know, it, it's different. Yeah. Very different. Um, this is going to be probably one of my favorite questions. This is something that Greg is going to know that I love and you guys might might not so much, but this is something I think is super That's important. Cool, yeah. All right. So how do you approach comms and how important do you think comms are at the professional level? How do I approach comms? Yeah. Uh, crazy. <laughs> My players know that I'm a psychopath. Like, I mean, here, this is a good story. We had terrible comms. When I mm -hmm. first came to this team, I didn't even understand what was going on. I'm like, is this how you guys calm? Yeah. Like, this is a professional team. This is how you guys calm. And that's no offense to them. It's just, right. I don't think they knew how. Mm -hmm. And it was never addressed. And I think it got to the point where they didn't realize that it was hurting them. But I view comms as mega, mega, mega important. Yeah. Um, it's just information. Like right. you're giving your team's information. So there's a difference between saying, Oh, I got, I'm last back need boost. That's not, that's not comms. Um, comms are, you know, giving your teammates information that they might not be readily like seeing. 
So talking, like very, very small talk, but concise. Oh, I think it's huge. Comms are, they're huge. I but love it's it. something we've worked on a ton, so. Um, I'm on the outside looking in. You know, I haven't, I haven't listened to a bunch of different professional teams communicate, but I would venture to guess that that is an area that many teams probably don't put much effort into, and I think it could be, like, big reward for them. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it might be a, a slight, a small change that could result in a, a nice improvement. I think, I think more teams now. Yeah. I think, and as you see the player, like, this is another funny thing. I think the players that are in the game now, the top-level pros, as they've gotten older, have realized how important comms are. Yeah. I think that if you, if you have a bunch of 15-year-olds and they're just sitting there just destroying everybody on the field, <laughs> they, they're, don't they, they, don't care, they don't care about comms. But <laughs> right. as they start losing a little bit and mm -hmm. as they start realizing, oh, this works or this doesn't, most top-level pros, 90, 95% of them will tell you, hey, listen, we don't comm well. Or we're working on comms. And I think that's something that actively a lot of pro teams are doing now. Yeah. Whereas it wasn't a thing maybe – in the past couple of years. Yeah. Um, we do have a, I want to give you a, a quick hot question from, uh, from chat here. We got T Bates in the chat oh, and he man. says, uh, oh, man. he says, Greg, okay. who is the best sub in pro play? And mm. why is it T Bates? All right, listen, it is T Bates <laughs> because if you bring T Bates into a script, let me tell you something. We've, we've scrimmed with T Bates before yeah. and he is a spark plug. Okay. And that's what I call him. I was like, listen, you just bring T-Bates in at any given point, and he's energizing the team. Number one, T-Bates <laughs> could have three hours in the past two weeks, and he goes out on the field thinking he's the greatest player on the planet. He'll call <laughs> any player on the other team. They're bad. They're terrible. Come on, let's get this. He's calling mid-passes. He's directing Ajax and Seal around. I mean, no, no. It's T-Bates, 100%. 100%. All right. Okay. 100%. I love it. So this is uh, – I'm going to tie both these questions together. The first question is going to be best way to men uh, reset mental after a tuss tough loss, and so you can approach that as well. But – after a tough loss, how do you determine as a team, like what to work on or, or what can we improve? And like, how is that, you know, what's that process look like? When, like, when is a tough loss occurring? Like maybe one game or a series or a, like a, a series. Let's I say, like let's say a tough, tough series. series. Yeah. Are you done for the day or are you still Ooh, going? Okay. Let's go. Uh, we're not done for the day. How, how do you approach that? We got to keep rolling. Oh, those are tough. Those are and tough. That's, that's <laughs> why, and that's why I was telling you, listen, after the, the first regional, I think yeah. that's when we learned a lot because mm -hmm. I had a, like a big heart-to-heart -heart with my team, and I said, hey, listen, guys, we are mentally fragile, okay? And we go down in a series, and the number one thing that we preached over that next couple, like two weeks before the regional two was resilience. And when we lost in regional one, like I'm talking about, didn't even make it out of day three. Yeah. Our resilience was awful. We were terrible. But the main thing is that we weren't communicating. If, so you lose, and then the call sounds like crickets. But, you know, so I'm sitting there, like, trying to, like, hype them up. And, I, and this is on me, too, because I shouldn't have been, you know, probably as upfront as I was. But I was new to that level of, like, adversity that they were going through. They weren't talking. And I think the number one thing is sometimes if you lose, you have to laugh it off, Okay. If you still have breath to go, you're not done. Yeah. You're like, so if you die after one series and you still have more series to go, what are we doing? What are we playing for? But I think that eventually it just took us, there was a couple of games against Oxygen that we had in, in day two or regional two that all of a sudden, and we played this Hercules tournament too, where we just kept coming back from behind over and over and over. And all of a sudden it was like, our team started believing, hey, wait we can do this every single time. So yeah. it, once they start believing they can do it, it's like, we're down 0-2, it doesn't matter. Like, this is where we want to be. But it's just breathing that confidence into them. And sometimes you have to take a loss and just say, hey, listen, it is what it is. Yep. Like, it's, I hate that statement, but for real, it is what it is. Move on, yep. drop it. But how are we going to fix it? I don't think overanalyzing it is a good thing. I think right. let's get back on the same page, level out, mellow out, and then we'll go back to it. So, okay, um... That's, that's how we're going to approach it when we've got to keep rolling in that day. You know, it's a long day. We've got multiple games or maybe a Swiss stage or whatever, right? Let's say we have a tough loss and not, a tough series, knocks us out of the tournament. Mm. What's the approach there? How, how do we navigate that as a team? Okay, you know me. Oh, yeah. So what am I doing? I'm calling, <laughs> and we're talking about it. It's just the way I am. Uh, and, I, you know, it might not be the best approach, but I know emotions are high, but you know what's open communication sometimes, going through those, like that's a trench moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're in the trenches with them and I'm pissed off. 
my team's mad, but what did we do wrong? All right, now we're all a little bit emotional about it. But eventually, you'll probably reach a point with the team. Where, here's the thing I think you should not do. Go directly into replays after you lose the whole tournament. Yeah. I think that's the worst thing. You start talking about tactics and what went wrong, because then you're going to have emotions flying. But right. talking about it from a general standpoint, we're like, we're leveling out, and hey, this is what we got to do better. This is what it is. Yeah. I think that's really, really good. Yeah. Um, but talking about it for sure, and then reset once you talk about it you reset the next day they'll probably have already got their emotions out yeah. now we can talk about it logically mm -hmm. kind of wipe so that's that, my approach get away. your stuff out there and communicate and then wipe that slate clean approach it with a fresh yeah. mindset i like that yep. all right you um, gotta have a close team to do that though because if you don't have a close team and somebody's really really you gotta be careful yeah but that's why we talked about in the beginning that that foundation you gotta have that good Build team environment before anything else you gotta have that good team environment and that's um, and, and, and that's another story i want to say is that when I first got here, I don't know if T Bait's still in the chat. He'll he might remember this. I used to tell my team, I'm not doing coaching. I'm not doing tactics until we get on the same page. Right. So I would tell them every single day about comms, like, hey, listen, if you guys don't start talking, what are we gonna look at replays for? Yeah. So we could sit there and say, Oh, you weren't comming there. Well, you didn't come. No, 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 no. We're talking, we're getting on the same page, we're learning how to talk to each other, and then we can start doing tactics. But but until we get on the same page, there's no way. It's just yeah. open communication first. So Building that team environment, like I said, that is number one priority for me, always. Okay, this is an interesting one. How do you balance criticism versus praise, and does that change from player to player? You're saying like coaching players? Yeah. It changes from player to player. Yeah. Some players need compliment sandwiches, I think. Yep. So it's like, hey, dude, you do this really, really, really well. Also, mm -hmm. never do this, but also you do this really, 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 like, really well. Some players, you just actually need to be real with them. Yeah. Like, it's just like, hey, listen, don't do this. Or, it could be something like rotating. It could be something like boost management. They need it like quick and concise. But some players, you actually have to build them up to it because once you drop that on them, they'll think about it for the next week. Right. They're like, remember, Greg, you told me that. Oh, and I've heard that too. Greg, you told me don't go for that corner boost. Look at me. I'm like, oh, my God. But it's, it's definitely individual. I think coaching yeah. in this game is individual. Like you could, from a team aspect, they know how I approach the team and it's going to mm -hmm. be the same. But when we're doing individual replays or I'm talking to them individually, it's a lot different. So yeah. I think, uh, and this, this will kind of flash back to our, what is a coach? I think there's a lot more social skill involved in coaching than, than most recognize. Would you agree with that? You need to be a leader. Yeah. It, I, I don't, to me, to be honest with you, that's something that's not different between esports and yeah. Agreed. And sports. If you have a coach on your esports team that isn't a leader and isn't a role model for your team, you're mm -hmm. doing it wrong. 100%. Right. And a lot of these players that say that, Oh, like they bring their friends into coaching. That is what it is. But if he's not leading your team, then what is he doing? I just don't, I just don't get it. Yeah. But yeah, no, you need to be a leader. You need to have good social skills. You need to be able to rally the troops. That's what a coach yeah. does. Rally the troops. That's right. This is a fun one. I think we, we hear about some of these pros and like a lack of, of hours. Um, and I, I remember there's been some discussion. There have been some orgs that, if I'm not mistaken, have tied hours like requirements into contracts. Mm. And so I want to ask you, how do you keep your players motivated to grind? And then also on the flip side of that token, how do you combat burnout? <laughs> well, <tough>. yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, no, that is tough because if, if your org is making you play, that's when I think you're going to get burned out. Right. Like if you, if you have a requirement, natural, just that energy with it, that's something that I look for in players. Like it's, mm -hmm. if you have that competitive drive, then you're going to put in the hours for it. Um, we've been burned out before. And I think it was right after uh, the fall split ended. And we, we went into scrims after regional three. And this was just after we lost in the game five versus Oxygen to go to the, to the, uh, yeah. the playoffs. And we scrimmed the next day. It was the dumbest thing I ever did. <laughs> we pulled up into those scrims and we looked so bad. I remember just looking at my team. I was like, what are we doing? Like, yeah. why are we like, this is absurd. And, they just sounded burnt out. Like it wasn't like there was like giving me like grief about it, but like I could just tell like yeah, they just need a break. So we took a week break and I told them, get away. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to play the game right now. We have time and we can come back to it. And most of the time what that's like what ended up happening is they're calling me like, okay, well now what are we gonna do when we do like for the next regional, like how are we gonna prepare? They came back to it more energized. But I think sometimes even just a little break away from the game is really, yeah. really good. That doesn't mean do it all the time. It means right. sometimes you have to do that. But yeah. as far as um, 
like staying motivated. External motivation to me, which is like you maybe want to prepare for a regional, that is what it is. But internal motivation where you're, you're trying to be the best, that's what I look for in players. And if you have yeah. an internal drive to stay motivated, that's when you're going to put in 100 hours, two weeks, 80, yeah. seven, however many you put in. Yep. Um, all right, and, and so this is going to be uh, just a final question here, and I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for, for giving us these detailed responses. Thank you for, uh, for taking the time and just chatting with us this morning. So this is the last one I've got here. What is your personal vision for Rocket League Esports over the next few years? Are there any like specific changes that you think you would like to see surrounding the esport? This can be format. Well, this can be, you know, what, whatever, whatever you can dream up. The format is great. The format is great, but I think that there needs to be more, as far as the eSport, I think there needs to be more emphasis on who the players are. Yes. I, I think that one of the main problems I've always had with Rocket League compared to other games is that we don't have personalities that people are looking at and like, or they're not always on display. That's right. So recently with a face cam addition to ROCS, I think that's a good first step. Mm -hmm. But I think that we need more insight into players. We need more player development into like, this is a personality. This is yeah. who this Octane is. This is who this Dominus is. And I That's think that right. more, the more you put that into there, the fans can grow and bond with teams. I don't think anybody even knows what Savvy Seal looks like. That's right. And that's not a big deal. But the point is, is that what do the players on KCP look like? What do the players on these other teams look like? And what's your Maybe personality? You know what, what's your personality? What's like, what about... What about NRG? Yeah, you know them, but it's because they're the number one team. But for other teams that are trying to get their players, like you got to introduce their personalities. But I also think Psionics could do a good job of introducing more ways to integrate player personality into the game. Yeah, um, I would love to see that. As far as like weird, like little UI stuff, as comp, you guys know comp uh, RL on Twitter. Put a coach mm. spectator slot in the game. Mm. I just don't get it. Like you just put it in the game. Because I'm watching third-person Discord streams or I'm watching on delay and I'm hearing my players go nuts. I don't know if it's bad. I don't know if it's good. I don't know if it's right. a goal. And then I'm coaching on delay and it's, it's terrible. Um, it, it really limits how effective a coach can be live yeah. in-game. Because you practice and I'm in the scrim. Yep. Like, so, we're, so I'm doing it live all the time and all of a sudden now it's RLCS day and I'm doing it live from the Hootie Who stream. Yep. We were doing, I was doing coaching live watching <laughs> Hootie Who stream like this. And then they would be going crazy. I'm like, all right, hey, hold up, hold up. And then all of a sudden, they're like, wait, grab kickoff. I'm like, dude, this is crazy. Yeah. We're just on delay. So it's, that's terrible. Maybe, I don't know, man. Like the format is, the format is so good. It's just so open. I just wish yeah. there was more like league type stuff. Like yeah. I miss, there's, there's part of me that's maybe like an old school fan that misses when, you know, NRGG2 once literally a year. And it was like, holy you know, they're playing on this Saturday and it's a yeah. best of seven. That's it. And that's yeah. the last time you're going to see them. And it's like, those games were so hype, but it's hard to balance the the quality with the quantity. Right. So if you're doing RLCS the way we are, then like, it's just, it's natural that if you have a league, it's not even going to feel the same. Yeah. I think I they're, I, I'm rambling. I just don't know. No, no, no. I agree. It's, it's I think you're, you're, the thing is you're describing what a lot of people talk about and how it almost feels like the value <laughs> of games has decreased because you see it so frequently and because there's just so yeah. much of it. But on the flip side of that, I think it's also better for players. I think they have more opportunities to earn. Um, they have more opportunities to prove themselves. And, and they also just have more opportunities in general because in that one G2 NRG game, if NRG has, has an off day, you might not get them again for you know six months yeah. or, or, or longer or whatever. And so I think there's pros and cons to it. Um, let me ask you this. This is something that I, I think is important. When we had the initial switch from two leagues, RLCS and RLRS, and then we went into RLCS X with the open format. We had the three splits where we had fall split was open qualification, and we had 32 teams in those regionals, right? And then we went oh, yeah. into the um, winter, and it had 24 teams, and then the spring had 20 teams. And then we come to this RLCS 21-22 season, and now we have 16 teams only, and that's for yeah. every event, right? Yeah. And so I do think it was a good thing because – Let's be honest, and I don't want to knock anybody, but there are teams in that top 32 that it doesn't even feel professional anymore. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 like, it doesn't feel like a real professional league because there's, I mean, there's pickup teams, you know, throw together teams. And that, as a viewer, makes me feel like this is not high quality professional league. So I think whittling it down is a good thing. But I think Agreed. on top of that, you've got to invest, my opinion, you have got, as an esport, you have got to invest in the upcoming talent. 
right? Right now we have this huge gap where you have all kinds of talent that is very, very good, and there's no reason for an org to invest in them because they get no representation. There's no chances for them to play the game and earn. Or you have the tippy top, those top 16, and those teams are, are comfortable and safe, and they're getting um, you know, compensated for their efforts. But what about everybody in between? And, and, and the reason I think it's important is because how can these players justify jumping from here to here when there's nothing in between? Right. There's nothing for, right. for them to grow with. There's no like, you know, I'm thinking of like a lily pad. Right. You can't jump mm -hmm. from one side of the river to the other. I got to have some stepping stones, some lily pads that I can that I can walk on to get across. So I think the easiest way to say this is just investing in tier two professional uh, Rocket League. How do you feel about that? I well, it's, it's are you talking about like RLRS kind of? Kind of. I don't know that it would be formatted in a league or, in the same as RS, but it's well, level like we're yes the bubble. yeah i mean i've been i've been a man i i used to be standing on the rooftop screaming about the bubble scene because yeah i thought that you can develop so much talent and so much high level rocket league play it's like the same thing where like you talk about you know you talk about professional teams at a sports level it's really mm -hmm. really competitive and like those are the greatest players but you go to the college level sometimes those games are super super competitive and those players go up to the pro level so i think investing in the bubble scene allows more orcs to get in and yep. allows more players to develop careers in this game yep. and i think that that allows more casters to develop careers in this game that yep. allows more coaches to develop careers in this game and maybe even for like tier two tier three orgs that are just trying to you know have a team and be proud of something that's huge for them mm -hmm. and these players that are feeling like oh they're representing these orgs that are that are doing great things that like it's big i agree that we need more emphasis on the bubble scene um the difficulty of it is do you cap the league? Do you say like, right. okay, if you made ROCS once, you can't join this league. Right. Because then you take away an integrity, like it's a competitive integrity where it's like, eh, like, is it good? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I just think that if Psyonix does anything, if Psyonix just says, this is our tournament and they brand a bubble league or whatever, like some type of competition like that, it will be huge. Yeah. It will. Because you're still going to have, all right, this is for ROCS, but then these are the other teams that you can look for that might make RLCS next time. That's right. And it gives them incentive to stay together too, <laughs> instead of like you said, pick up teams and Yeah. Yeah. I think I think something else that does is I think it actually pushes that top level even further because yeah. they're gonna have to grind harder, right? It also will allow I mean, essentially, it's farm leagues, right? We see it in mm -hmm. traditional sports. We take the NBA, we got the D League or, or whatever <laughs> else, right? We have these uh, AAA and AA for baseball. We have these leagues to develop talent and to allow these players that maybe haven't made it there yet but are refining those skills, they're, they're getting there. It allows them a place to, to belong as well. And I think um, that was the biggest drawback in the shift from the two leagues to this new format. And I think it's, I still think it's worth it. I love this new format. I think it's, advantageous on so many different levels, but that is something that I would love to see um, added to this new format. And you know what? You actually bring up a good point because now I'm thinking about it a little bit. When it was 32 teams, you actually, as a, as a player, as a player, you genuinely felt like you were making it. Like, you're coming into quals and you're like, I can make it. And then once we get there, it doesn't matter. It goes down to 24. It's the same way. Um, but I think that now... If you're a bubble team, you're probably pretty frustrated because Absolutely. the day that you have to have, uh, the day that we have to have to get into the main event is absurd. Like, right. we were just talking about this with my team last night. Like, day three is no joke at right. all. Like, so you're talking about days one and two. B before the last regional, we, uh, we finished ninth through 12th. We almost lost on day two. Mm -hmm. We were down game five in the lower bracket on day two. And we had to go into overtime to win that. So... Those teams are no joke, and, and like you could tell, those bubble teams they fight hard mm -hmm. because they think they're going. They see you, they see United. They're like, we're smacking this team. This is this is our chance. We're going to take their award. We're going to take their money. Okay, but I just wish that it was there was something for those players to not be frustrated about because you can't just have these random fifty dollars tournaments and have everybody right. excited about it. You're not going to get the top level in there. That's right. It's almost like we had when the talent pool, the depth of the talent pool, player wise, was smaller. There was more spots. Agreed. Agreed. And now the depth has gotten larger, and there's actually 
far fewer spots for players to to prove themselves. So that's something that I have. Um, and, and I think, to be honest with you, I'm optimistic that that will be something they approach. You know, in RLCSX, obviously that's a massive overhaul. There's yeah. only so much they can change within a season. And then this season, we've seen the addition of four new regions. That's a massive undertaking as well. And so I think uh, I'm optimistic, and maybe this is naive, I don't know, but I am hopeful that the next logical step is, hey, we've got this, you know, this top tier league. This is where our premier league, our premier players, this is where it is. We got to invest in that upcoming talent next. And to be fair, like you said about RLCS, I think RLCS should just be 16 teams. Yeah. For RLCS, so you can make it pro. Right. But there needs to be something else. Yes. That's all I can say. Is I that agree. If you're just going to have RLCS, let the RLCS teams be in RLCS. Mm. But, and if you can get in there, great. The, right? But that's 16 teams. That's It should be exclusive. It, mm -hmm. it should not be easy to make RLCS. Right. But there should also be another challenging part of it because those teams that are maybe like 17 through 48, 17 through 54, those teams are no joke either. And that's you can right. have anything happen in there. So give them something to compete for too. I love it, man. Greg, thank you so much for joining us, dude. Thank you so much for thank the you. insight. I appreciate you giving us in-depth responses, giving us a look behind the curtains, man. I appreciate that tremendously. Do you have any last words or anything you want to say before we close the show? No, nah, I appreciate you. You're the GOAT, as always. Um, I appreciate you letting me talk because, for real, like a lot of coaches don't get to talk like this. And because I have that relationship with you, like anytime you want to do this, I'm down to come on. So I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much, Greg. I appreciate everyone for tuning in. Hope, we, uh, hope it was insightful and enjoyable. And we will catch you guys next time. Peace.